thank you so much and thank you all for joining us this morning uh, or afternoon or evening or whatever time of day it is for you. Um, so I thought I'd start off today by telling you, I think it was uh, just over a decade ago that I stepped into the head teacher's office of the school I was teaching in and resigned. Um, and I resigned to go and do something different and set up the Centre for Education and Youth because I had a sense that a lot of the problems I was facing in the classroom were actually problems that needed action at a policy level. And I thought that there were lots of things I could see that if they just changed them, then it would make the lives of my pupils and the, my colleagues so much better. But it's now been just over a decade I've been doing that. And it's come to, I've come to realize that often it's not so much just about generating sensible solutions, it's actually about generating political will for change. And so the education policy community of practice from Teach for All today uh, decided that we'd bring together some amazing experienced policymakers from right across the world uh, to share their experiences of generating political will uh, to, for educational equity. And so I'm really delighted uh, to introduce a fantastic set of speakers today, but they will actually tell you a little bit about themselves uh, when they begin to speak. So what we're going to start off with is um, something a bit surprising, I think, for a session at a conference that is always so positive and upbeat. But we're going to take you on a bit of a journey over the next hour and a bit. Um, and we're going to start off by talking about failure. So what I've done is I've asked each of our speakers um, to begin by thinking about a time when they feel that there was a failure, when they tried to change something, that they were left frustrated. Um, because they couldn't generate the action they wanted to secure. Um, and what we want to draw from that is what lessons they learned. So I'm not going to carry on talking any longer because I want our speakers uh, to, to hold the floor. So we're going to start off with about 20 minutes in which each of our speakers is going to tell us their story of failure. I'm then going to come back with a few questions to them and then give you a chance uh, for questions before we move on to the positive stuff, which is three considerations that each of these experienced individuals provides for you uh, in terms of what you, they think you could do to help generate the political will in these kind of situations. So I'm going to start off with uh, Luis, if that's OK, uh, because he's first on my screen and, and ask you please to share, uh, share with us uh, your story of failure and frustration. Look, thank you so much um, and thanks everyone and thank you for joining the session today. Um, yeah, I'm gonna jump right into it. And before I, 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 I share my personal story of, of failure, I actually thought that the, the notion of sharing a story of failure was very much in line with something that has been bugging me for the past few months with which is, and, and I can say these because I think I've, I'm, I'm at guilt of, of, of the result that we're seeing, but 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 um, I've come to the realization that that in Latin America, the truth is that we have made no progress in education for the roughly past uh, uh, 15 to 20 years. And that is very hard to say because um, because it, it, it means that we've spent an entire generation of pupils going from pre kindergarten all the way into their adulthood and, and we have done nothing to make sure that education is actually something that is mobilizing. Uh, them into better lives. And that is hard to say because it's good to be an optimist, but the reality is that where I remember very clearly that when I was um, a student in the International Education Policy Program at Harvard, uh, the discussions we were having about the challenges of education in Latin America were identical to the discussions that we're having today uh, with a little changes here and there. Uh, so it's important to, to face failure. I think it's very important to be honest about failure and, and be bold about recognizing when things are not going well um, and about the need to make changes. And, and very specifically, kind of discussing my own failure. Um, when I was at the ministry as, as serving as deputy minister of education in Colombia, we embarked in a series of very ambitious reforms, one of which was the reform of the teaching profession, which is a very complicated uh, bureaucratic profession as it is in most countries around the world. And, and we thought, I, I was joined by a fantastically talented team of, of young people coming from the best educational institutions around the world um, that had read and studied everything that, that had to be studied about education reform in the world. So when we arrived in the ministry, we said, well, this is fairly simple. All we need to do is just share the knowledge that we have because we are so wise 
uh, with the general public and everyone is going to understand and we are going to garner all that political support that we need uh, to implement these reforms. Uh, so we went on in this campaign um, using everything at our disposal, the, the, the newspapers, media outlets to share data. And so we started sharing data about the teaching profession. Um, and, and we were there like just pouring data into, into the public, convinced as we were that that was going to be enough. Um, but then obviously when it came to actually getting into the battle of ideas in Congress and, 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 and in the public sphere, we failed miserably. Nobody was really understanding our message and all the data that was true was, was making absolutely no impact in the way people perceived the reality of the teaching profession. So we had to pivot, but I'm not going to go into the story of how we pivoted. I'm going to kind of dive more into why we failed. And I came up with these little um, phrase that I keep using, which is, it's all true, but it's not all the truth. And what I mean by that is that even though all that data that we were sharing was true, it was just a part of the truth. The other part of the truth was the one we were ignoring. And that was the nuances of public perception about the teaching profession. That was a long story of the teaching profession, the complexities around these, the political phenomena surrounding the teaching profession. Um, and, and so again, not to draw lessons right here, but, but I, I think the, the, the first thing that I quickly understand, thankfully this happened early in our tenure, was it, it, it takes a lot more uh, than feeding data and policy papers uh, in order to make significant reform. I think right now, if anything, we have an overload of these type of information. So that was my story of, of, of failure. It was a significant failure. It took us months to kind of get back on our feet. Uh, we were defeated, uh, literally defeated in a very public way. Um, but I'm going to stop there. And then when we draw more uh, kind of conclusions later in the, in the talk, I'll, I'll be happy to, to tell you more about how that ended. Thank you, Luis. That's very helpful. Great. Okay, and um, my next speaker is Suet Lee from the opposite time zone uh, in Malaysia. Thank you, thanks for having me. So while I'm at the opposite time zone, like my story is so similar to Louise's story as well. Um, I was not the deputy minister, I was the, an officer to the former minister. Um, and just a little bit of context before I start sharing as well. In the last two years, Malaysia has undergone quite a bit of political turmoil and there's been quite a few changes in um, the political landscape. And you know, the last 60 years or so um, since independence, we've always had the same government. And it was only in 2018 that there was a change in government. Um, and that's when I joined the minister's office as well. So, you know, given this change, I think people were generally really dissatisfied with the previous government, uh, which is why they voted for this new, polit new political alliance to come in. So there was a lot of political instability as it is. And therefore there were a lot of, I think, expectations for quick reforms when the new government came in. And I think that was quite scary for us um, to, to undertook an office where there were so much expectations for quick reforms. And as you know, in education, reforms can be quick and, and results normally take a long, long time, right? Um, which is why it was quite difficult for us when we came up with plans, just like Louise's office, we came up with all these plans um, that, that seemed quite intellectual. We talked about quality and equity, but this wasn't what people wanted to hear. Um, I think also because the stakeholders were so varied and, and there were so many competing needs between different groups of people. Um, and in Malaysia, there were, there were contexts of race and religion and language and different social economic groups. I think we failed to grasp the complexity of these different um, tensions that already exist. So I think when we first came in, we made it an intellectual practice where we came up with data as well. We talked about the need for improvement of quality and equity, but we didn't quite understand. And we were blindsided completely by how deep-rooted um, how deep rooted this, some of these sentiments already are in different groups of people. So I think our ultimate failure, uh, we were only in office for a year and a half. Our ultimate failure is we did not have the political skill um, as well as capital to maneuver around these complex issues that have already existed for a long time. Um, and as well as not having effective communication strategies on top of that to, quite, um, to break down really complex ideas to different groups of people. So I think that was um, the ultimate failure that we had. And the big lesson that I had from it is understanding public policy as not just a, 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 a not, not just policies, it's a lot more about the public than policies really. Um, and we were not able to navigate these sentiments as and not be consumed by the sentiments 
Um, and therefore, we, were, we spent a lot of time firefighting instead of explaining our vision, instead of breaking down these ideas and communicating and getting buy-in from different people. So all in all, we, you know, what I realized is our office had the convictions to change things, um, but because we didn't have the political skill to maneuver around these complex issues, a lot of the decisions that we wanted to make were just not able to be executed at the end of the day. So yeah, that's the sharing from my end. Thank you. Okay. Um, and circling back gradually towards uh, where I am here in the UK, uh, Anil Swarup, sir, um, can I turn to you please in India? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. What a pleasure it is to be here. When I took over as school education secretary in 2016, uh, I did not have much of an experience of the sector before that. Before that, I was handling coal, which had run through various camps and was known for mafias. And I thought that I was moving from dark dungeons of coal mines to the bright lights of school education. But I soon discovered that whereas in coal sector, all the mining was underground and the mafias were overground, in education sector, it was the other way around. All the mafias were underground eating into the essentials of Indian society. And I also discovered that teachers lay at the pivot of school education. And that's where most of the mafias were operating. And I will narrate a very brief incident of where we failed in handling one such mafia. You know, in India, we have this system of pre-school or pre-service training, which is called Bachelor of Education and uh, Diploma of uh, School Education. And there are about 16,000 such colleges in the country. And to my horror, I discovered 4,000 of them did not exist at all. They were just in paper and they could give you a degree. Now, this was the extent and they had such a stranglehold uh, all over the country that you couldn't do anything. Now, imagine a scenario that a teacher who's not trained get into government service on the basis of that certificate. So the chairman of the National Council of Teacher Education who worked with me, he came to meet me and asked me whether they, he could take on this mafia. I said, please go ahead and he did start. And what did he do? He just issued a simple letter to them asking them to furnish information regarding their geographical details, who all are teaching on an affidavit. Now that really set the cat amongst the pigeons. The reason was that if they gave wrong information on affidavit, it would be a criminal offense. Now these guys ganged together they tried to influence the politician, but because of the interaction that we were having with most of the senior politicians and we convinced them into believing that this is very critical to education in this country, they all agreed with us. And they these mafias did not find support with the politician. So what did they do? They just went to the courts. They went to 17 high courts in the country, three of which granted stay order. In India, we have a very interesting system of courts granting stay order and then do nothing about it, but you can't do anything thereafter. So the chairman NCT appeared with, before one of the courts personally because he considered it very important and argued before them that he was only seeking information. What was wrong in that? Why do you stay seeking of information? For some reason, which may be probably discovered over the years, the judge got very annoyed with him and he issued a notice to me as Secretary of Education Government of India asking me how chairman NCT could be removed. Now, it was going totally diff in a different direction. So far, we had all the political support and all. And once judiciary came down heavily on this officer, who in sheer frustration, because he was really trying to do uh, some good things, he resigned from the Indian Administrative Service, which is a premium service, premier service in the country. He had to resign. I was extremely frustrated and distraught. And that is when, when I discovered that it is easy to have an idea in a country like ours, which is fortunately a democracy, but for an idea to fructify and sustain over a period of time, it has to be politically acceptable, socially desirable, technologically feasible, financially viable, administratively doable, and finally judicially tenable. If somehow the judiciary for some reason finds a reason not allow you to do something, you can't do anything. Of course, I'm so glad that now that the national education policy has been announced, this issue would probably be resolved in that. And it was thanks to the noise that we created at that point in time. At that point in time, it appeared very frustrating, but glad that it has been noted and it could be sorted out. Thank you. Thank you very much. And interesting that ultimately that noise proved to be useful in the longer run. And it's often difficult, isn't it? That bal balancing of the shorter term horizons and the longer term horizons and what can seem like a success or a failure at one point may indirectly be a, a, the opposite further down the line. Thank you. Um, on to Jonathan, Jonathan Simons. 
Uh, thanks very much, uh, and thanks very much, Loic and, and, and everyone else. Absolutely fascinating to, to hear other people's reflections, and, and mine, I think, is in a, in a broadly similar sense. So this was when um, I was uh, not working in the UK government. I spent most of the decade working in the UK government. This was after um, when I was informally advising uh, the current UK government. Uh, the UK, or technically the English uh, school system, uh, has moved over the last 10 years to make our school systems gradually independent of local government uh, and they are called academies in the UK they're broadly similar to charter schools in the US or uh, similar similar sort of independently run and managed schools in many other school territories around the world and uh, the majority of high schools in England are these uh, academies and a minority of primary schools elementary schools and this causes um, some complexities because you have two different ways of running the system and local government runs and controls and manages some schools and uh, independent trustees and charities run uh, the majority of these schools. So the uh, UK government, who is responsible for English education, decided in uh, 2012 to pass a law to require all schools to become over time independent academies. Um, and this was something which the majority Conservative government at the time had hitherto been strongly in favour of. It had been a Conservative government who had uh, given the option to many schools in 2010 to become these academies and, and it had been taken up quite popularly and so the view was uh, and the view was informed by people like me that on the face of it this was a good thing to do that a lot of people adopted into it and it made sense to just push the laggards over the edge by requiring it and uh, long story short this proved spectacularly unpopular not just with the people who had always opposed the principle of these schools, but including conservative legislators and lawmakers who were in favour of the policy, but didn't like their local schools being mandated to move into it. They liked the optionality, but they didn't like the mandation of it. And um, it was the governing party rather than the opposition, the governing party that uh, stopped the own, their own education secretary implementing this policy. And I, I take from that failure a number of lessons similar to those that have already been shared by others. So the first thing is that people respond to things in a different way when it affects them locally than it does nationally. Uh, and politicians are no different from this. They can be happy for something to happen nationally, but if something happens in their local patch, they may be resistant to do so. And that's because as local politicians, they are affected by different motivations than they are nationally. So they face local political pressure from people who are important in their constituencies and, and, and they are the people that get them re-elected as politicians. So you can push so far nationally, but locally you face a different set of motivations. The second thing is I was really struck by uh, Louis' uh, point about the difference between, you know, it is, it's, it's the, I can't remember how eloquently he phrased it, but it's all true, but it's not all the truth. Um, it is all true, the arguments that it would have been easier for these schools to move under one system, but that was not all the truth. And essentially, in practice, people are happy to accept a greater level of inefficiency in exchange for them having the freedom to choose that inefficiency. And when, when push came to shove, people were happy to make that decision, and we had underestimated that. And thirdly, I take the lesson that much politics, particularly in democratic countries, is about a very slow, often painful, inching forward of reform. And, and, and not always, but often making big leaps forward can be counterproductive and harder to do. And actually in many ways, the trick of politics is to make a continual slow movement forward in the same direction. And it's always never as quick as you want it to be and people chafe at the frustration of it but that is how I think most change happens. And what happened in this example is that the English government tried to take a big leap forward, had misunderstood people's motivations, uh, and that's where it went wrong. Great, thank you. Um, super interesting and, and fascinating to see just how much um, and the extent to which there are overlaps in these very different settings. Um, one thing that struck me uh, across all of those examples was the notion of overestimating your reach, overestimating and overreaching, uh, thinking that you can you can do more than you can. Um, but it also flagged something for me in terms of does that does that risk people becoming under ambitious? 
And I was wondering if each of the speakers would comment a little bit on how you can balance not wanting to overestimate what you can achieve, but still remaining ambitious. I don't know who would like to go first. Yeah, Jonathan. So I, um, I think, I think it's really important as a politician that you do have a vision uh, and that you do set out that vision and, you, and you, you repeat it often to bring people along with you. People are not on the whole going to sign up to a politician who is purely uh, about incremental reform. But it's also incumbent upon you as a politician and for people like us who advise politicians to help them set through a roadmap to implement that vision. You can't just point to something brilliant you want to change in 20 years time and say, let's do that now. You have to show how you will move slowly and, and you, can't, you can't move away from your vision. You have to know where you're going towards. But if you don't know what those steps look like, you're just you're, you're painting a picture of something which is unrealistic. And if it's not as, as far as I said, technically feasible and socially desirable and politically doable and economically valid, viable, then, then there's no point doing it. You're just, you know, you're just, you might as well be writing stories. Um, any other thoughts on that from our speakers? Yes, Anna Sorokson. Well, I look at it slightly differently. As a civil servant, my job was primarily to advise the politician. And the challenge for me was, can I convey a value proposition to the politician? Because without that, if I tell him this is right and this is wrong, this is good for the country, it won't work. It doesn't work. What does he stand to benefit by way of his popularity, by way of his votes, by way of his the recognition that he will get. I had to couch my advice in that language, which we understood. And I've, I've written a few chapters in my book, Ethical Dilemmas of a Civil Servant, where I actually highlight this point. That's very important for the advisors or the civil servants to understand the limitations within which a politician works. I would refuse to believe that politicians don't have a vision. Almost everyone has a vision. Sometimes that vision may be wrong, but they do have a vision. So it's wrong to say that they don't have a vision. The idea is to convince him about something which you think is right in a manner that he accepts. It's like selling any product. It's selling an idea to a politician. So that was my continuous challenge in the in the in the um, in the uh, of the point that I mentioned earlier during the one of my failures. There and also, I did manage to convince the politician about the efficacy, utility of the idea that was being sold. I faltered at the level of judiciary. And for that's, that's a blind area. We don't know really as yet what to do. But with politician, having spent 38 years with them in the civil service, I don't think it's very, very difficult. There would be some time that he won't understand. And I, I probably did not come across any politician who didn't have a vision. So everyone has a vision. It's a question of implementation. Ideas are dime a dozen. You, I tell you, there are ideas to solve every problem in the country. The problem is making it happen on the ground. And the six factors that I mentioned earlier, political acceptability, social desirability, was basically to make things happen on the ground. I don't know about other countries, but India, the problem is not of ideas. The problem is not of vision. The problem is making things happen on the ground. And would you mind saying your six things again, sir? Because uh, I saw a question uh, in the box. Uh, I, have written, I have written it in the oh, chat box. It's there. Brilliant. It's there in the Thank chat you. box for everyone to see. Okay. Luis? Like, yeah, if, if I may, just a very quick comment is, I, I think politicians sometimes are very ambitious about the final step and very unambitious about the next step. And, and, that, and that's a little bit in line with what Jonathan was saying. So you can't have huge ambitions for the end of the journey and be totally unambitious about what you need to do tomorrow. So I, I think the way to balance those things is to be equally ambitious about the next step. Even if that next step is not going to win you any award or anything, if you are not able to uh, fulfill that next step, you're never going to get to the last step. Uh, so, so I think that is a good way to balance those, those th that tension between ambition and, and, and a sense of reality. Great, thank you. Um, so Lee, would you like to come in? And uh, uh, something, that, something else I'd like you, perhaps you to say a bit more about is you mentioned the notion of political capital when you were speaking. And I think that might be an interesting concept to look at a little bit for, for everyone who's here. So perhaps if you could say a little bit about what you meant by political capital and we can explore what that, how that plays out in different settings. Sure. So let me just uh, 
comment on what Sir Anil was saying as well. I think coming from a different spectrum, so I was working in the political office, and what we failed to do um, really well was to actually work with the civil service. And I think that was our biggest failure, right? Politicians come and go, and they come up with their ideas, like you said, um, but the ability to really find champions within the civil service to champion the ideas and to work with you on the ideas, I think these are things that we didn't manage to do really well. So we came in thinking that they were, we are saviors and we are coming to save the education system, but we didn't truly listen to what um, the administrators have to say about what are truly the pain points and what are, are the challenges. And I think that's what we didn't do really well. So that's the other end of the spectrum of what Sarnia was saying. Um, in terms of political capital, I think because in Malaysia, because of the political context I was sharing earlier, um, th there was competing democracies, right? Like it, it was the tension between between different political parties was so high. Um, and when my minister first came in, he was a, a rookie minister in a sense. So he didn't have experience working politically before. So a lot of the ideas that he wanted to bring, he wasn't able to garner support from people from across different political divide. So I think he didn't have that capital to begin with. He didn't have the strength politically to make difficult decisions as well as to follow through with them. So that's what I meant by that. Okay, thank you. Okay, i um, just ask for other comments um, from a panel on this idea of political capital, but I'm also seeing some questions start to appear in the chat, which is great. Um, and if people could post their questions in the chat, we have uh, Maduka and Danielle who are looking, keeping an eye on the chat. And uh, in five, 10 minutes, I'll hand over to them to present some highlights from those questions. So please, please feel free to put your, your questions in there and then we'll, we'll come to them in a round shortly. And who else would like to give us their thoughts on this notion of political capital and how that plays out? Something? Yeah, just keep waving when you when you want my attention. I'm watching. <laughs> I think one of the things, um, and we see this a lot in the English system, is amongst people who lobby the government, so education experts, teachers unions, charities, trade associations, businesses, lots and lots of people have lots of views as to what the government should do in schools. And I'm always surprised when people are surprised that a government is political. So people often in England say things like, well, why doesn't the government just do the right thing? Why don't we take politics out of education? Why don't why is the government doing these things? I don't agree with them. And it always surprises me because of course politicians are political. That is how they get elected in democracies. They get elected on a political platform and they are concerned about getting re-elected. And of course, a, in the UK, a conservative government is going to do different things from a Labour government or a Liberal Democrat government. And just because a politician becomes the Secretary of State for Education, does not mean that he or she is not still a conservative or a Labour politician. And it always surprises me, and I, and, I, and I advise my clients on this all the time, is that you need to recognise that a politician is going to think politically. And, and that is just, you know, part of the system. And therefore, unless you are suggesting things to them, which are at least broadly in line with their political thinking, and which they are going to be able to get past their political colleagues and through the political legislature which is dominated by their political party you're not going to get anywhere um you know so this conservative government for example has traditionally spent less in public money than the labor government has um that is just one of the things which defines them they tend to be a lower tax lower public spending party and therefore if you're going to go to a conservative secretary of state for education and demand that he or she spend vast amounts of money on schools it might be technically a good idea, but it is not, to use the list of six again, it is not politically feasible. It's just not going to happen. And so a lot of people in England find themselves bashing up a brick wall when they say the government doesn't listen to them. And the government does listen to them. It just it doesn't agree with them because it doesn't fit politically where they come from. Thank you. Any other thoughts on political capital? Yeah, Lewis? Yeah, I'll be happy to introduce a quick... I, I think... Uh, there, there's kind of two layers of political capital. There's first the political capital that a government has in general and whether or not it's willing to spend that in education. But there's also the political capital that the sector itself has. And I think that's very important. Like it, there is a difference because within a government, there's different levels of political capital. And it may be the case that the finance minister has more political capital than the, than the education minister or any minister for the sort can have more political capital. So I think Aside from the political capital, 
uh, that, that's facing the public, which is the one that we generally understand. Um, for, for, for a lot of people that are working in education sectors and in education systems, it also becomes important to garner political uh, capital inside the government. And I remember in, in our experience that was that was hard won. You, you need to fight for that political capital. You make to you need to make sure that for a president that may be relatively agnostic about education, um, he or she needs an argument that is powerful coming from within their cabinet so that she's willing to spend her political capital vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Congress in, in an educational agenda. Yeah. And then, sir, do you have anything to say on political capital? You know, I have not debated much about political capital because for the simple reason I can't do anything about it, it's there. Whatever the politicians thinks, I have always wondered about the role that civil servants and the advisors could perform to convey, as I keep saying, a value proposition to the politician, realizing the fact that he's after all a politician, he has his constituency, he has his voters. So that is the packaging that really needs to do to push across an idea for implementation. And I totally agree with the point that was being made with regard to the implementation part of it, you know, the politician may think, I mean, he may have a vision, but he know he would know what, but he would not know how. And that's where the role of civil servant comes in, to make it happen to the how part of it, the, the brass tacks of it, the operational part of it, that's where it comes in. And I've, I've spent most of my time doing that rather than only thinking of ideas. Ideas are, as I said, time a dozen. Okay, thank you. Um, unless there's any other thoughts from a panel, uh, I'm going to move, uh, hand over to uh, Maduka and Daniel to uh, summarize some uh, some thoughts from the chat and some questions. If you're there, Maduka, Daniel. If not, I will take a look myself. Uh, yes, Loic, we are ah, here. Okay, right. um, Thank you. Okay. One one of the questions of the audience is talking about corruption within the political class and the education system. And the question is, how do we reform education when there are so many vested interests? And continue with that idea, there's another interesting question about uh, what do you think all it's the best, uh, the biggest, sorry, the biggest area for opportunity that gives you optimism for working with governments? So maybe we could work on these two questions, Loic. Okay, yeah. And perhaps we, if we have time, we can address other questions that are appearing here in the chat. Oh, cool. okay. And yeah, do keep posting them as we discuss. So, uh, so two questions there. One is around how we address vested interests or corruption um, to, to continue to drive forward educational equity. And secondly, around what, what, bring, what sources of optimism are there uh, in terms of generating political will for educational equity. Um, who'd like to start us off? <laughs> Go on, Jonathan. One of the reasons I asked Jonathan is I know he's always got something to say. Sorry, I, 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 <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I'm always, I'm always sticking my hand up and nobody, nobody else seems to want to. Um, so I think, I think it's worth separating out corruption from vested interests. So corruption is, to state the obvious, uh, an illegal activity and is something which we should try and squeeze out of public activity. But other stakeholders have legitimate vested interests. So teacher trade unions, their job is literally to defend their members, to argue for better terms and conditions, to raise salaries, to protect their working condition. That is, off, teacher trade unions are often seen as a negative by governments, but that is literally their job. They take money from their members in order to argue on behalf of their members, just like business groups do uh, on behalf of businesses. And I think it is important to not denigrate the voices of teacher trade unions just because they are coming from a different perspective. They can be obstructive to what we might think of as the right level of change that needs to happen and indeed there are many instances in the world where teacher trade unions have blocked what in my view are sensible reforms that ought to have happened but you can't simply wish them away 
And in many instances, to go back to the point that Louis made earlier about political capital, teacher trade unions have more political capital than governments and ministers have. And I've seen many instances where uh, a teacher trade union has said one thing and a minister has said another thing and more people will believe the teacher trade unions. So in many countries, you can't afford to ignore the, the, the vested interests. You need to be able to, to plot a path and find something that either they can agree with or you do have to take it on and, and, and face it down and push it through in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a, an act of political strength. But if you do so, you have to be very clear what you're doing and how and why. And public opinion here is really, really important. If you want to do something like that, you have to ensure as a minister or as a political reformer, you have public opinion behind you and that it is solidly behind you. So that if you end up having an argument with a vested interest, you think that most of the public will agree with you. And so before you make a big move, it's so important to have your own political capital and have an understanding of where public opinion is so that if you decide you, you do have public opinion behind you, you can push past the vested interest. And if not, you need to see if you can find a mutually beneficial uh, end point. Okay. Uh, if, I, if I may come in, I, yes, uh, yes. in a democracy, vested interests are a natural occurrence. I, I, we should not be worried about it. In fact, uh, it's the balancing of these interests that's the trick all about. So I'm not too concerned about vested interests. They would be there. They should be there, in fact. And you have negotiations and you sort them out. My concern is about the corruption part. And it will vary from country to country, depending on the nature of uh, corruption that exists. And there, I think it would be very important to understand the cause of the corruption to handle that type of corruption. So when I spoke about uh, the experience that I had about the training colleges, it actually is corruption. What else do you call it? The colleges don't exist. And they're giving degree. What could be worse than that? And they're much worse here. In some cases of recruitment of teachers, you're one of the former chief ministers of a state is behind the bars for running that racket of selection of teachers. So these are important. Now, the, the good news is that today we have technology to take care of most of such corruption that exists. Today. And that's what we are moving. And there's, uh, there was very interesting question, probably that has not come from discussion. What gives me hope? What gives me hope is technology and the emerging political will, at least in India. The national education policy announced recently by the government is a clear indication that the government means business. For them, education is important. You know, that was the biggest problem that I had. Well, at some point in time, for a politician, education was not important because the consequences of poor financing of education will be seen five, 10 years down the line and here politician is busy about tomorrow. If that be the case, he was not concerned about education. Now it's back on the agenda with the national education policy. So these two things give me hope. Technology gives me hope because a lot of corrupt practices can actually be handled through use of technology. There's not time enough, otherwise I would have explained. And secondly, there is this willingness on the part of the politician that education is important. I think these two are very positive news. That gives me hope. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Lee and Luis, anything to say on these two questions? So I do have a quick comment. Go ahead, please. So it. Okay. So I'm just going to add very quickly on the corruption bit as well, as that was the main thing that we were fighting for too. Um, but it was quite difficult in the beginning because when we talked about corruption, it was mainly in, within the system. Um, there, were, there were contracts, for example, that were given within the system. That, and it was hard to weed out because we are now the government. So we're, we're not able to share the, the details of the corruption, for example. Um, so I think what we did, exactly like what Sarania said as well, we relied on technology quite a bit. Take out the human factor in, in selecting vendors, selecting contracts, and leave it to technology, leave it to the computers to decide instead. Um, that helped quite a bit. But what we also did that I think, I think was really helpful was to outsource a lot of the accountability measures to the public instead. So for example, when it came to funding um, schools and building dilapidated schools, previously there were quite few accountability measures to ensure that these schools are actually these schools are actually built. Um, so what we, what we did was we set up measures so that the public can comment, the public can actually send pictures um, to show whether the schools have been built or not. I think public accountability was what we did to beat corruption, but that was, yeah. So that was the main, main thing that we were fighting for as well. Sorry, Luis. No, thank you. Um, just a, a couple of quick comments. So the first one on the corruption and, and the outright corruption, I, I, I think there is no way to put it 
other than it takes a lot of courage to go against these things. The, 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 these are these are well ingrained, powerful mafias that are there. Uh, in in my case, for example, I, I had to face a very very complicated uh, mafia around school meals, and and that's probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my entire life. Actually, five years later, I'm still facing a number of different inquiries because once you once you go against these mafias. They're going to fight back and they're going to fight back very hard. But there is no other way rather than go, going against them and after them. Otherwise, if you, if you think that you can kind of play a political game with criminals, uh, you're going to lose and, and children are going to be affected. So, so there is a point where you have to face the reality that it, it's a choice. The second comment around vested interest, I think there is one complexity about the education system that is important to understand. And it's that there is not necessarily one vested interest, but because of the way money flows in the educational system, where most of that budget is actually fragmented into small salaries, it means that you are not facing a big, for example, a big infrastructure project. Most of what you're doing is that you're channeling salaries to hundreds of thousands or millions of people. And that makes it a lot harder than actually tackling uh, a big infrastructure project. And because of that, it educate, the educational sector is very prone to becoming a rent seeking, seeking sector. And it's relatively easy to capture a rent when you have salaries because salaries are recurrent. And that means you're not just having a big project uh, that's a one-off, but you're essentially creating new posts, new jobs. And the way you assign those jobs is where you can start getting the, the politics and corruption that can also be a part of that. So there's a, a lot of complexity and there's also a gray line between corruption and a vested interest when, for example, you're saying these are salaries, but there, there's politics that allow in for a, polit a local politician to assign um, those, those, those positions without any meritocracy. So how do you navigate these things in a sector where, again, most of the money flows in fragmented forms of recurring payments to individuals. And, and that is one of the challenges, I think, of, of the education sector in general. Thank you. OK, we have 10 more minutes for questions. So I thought I'd take one more round of, uh, of summary questions uh, from Danielle, please, or Madhuka. Great, Loic. We are receiving very interesting questions. And there are two questions that are kind of uh, connected between them and are about stakeholders. So the question is, what do you all think regarding the role of different stakeholders for building a strong political will towards education? And it is connected to other question that it's about long-term change, long -term change uh, that often requires short-term concessions, which are uh, politically or socially unpopular. So again, how do we talk about education reform with stakeholders and address this reality? Hey. Who would like to kick us off on the, both this question of the role of different stakeholders and the long-term versus short-term and the trade-offs between the two? And it's got to be someone other than Jonathan who goes first this time. would have been you would have picked up some name and asked him to speak but since you haven't i let me come in here i'm doing my you know, teachers I, I used to be a teacher i still do waiting time <laughs> I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with silence okay <laughs> absolutely fine so, <laughs> you get the best you know, I, I spoke about these six dimensions or six uh, constraints and i added the seventh one recently and that's important in the context of the question asked just now the seventh dimension is emotionally relatable now what does it mean Am I able to, or a politician is able to sell an idea to the masses, an idea that he may have, may to begin with appear unpopular, but if you convey it appropriately, if you package appropriately, it becomes popular. So while doing something in education sector, I mean, I read that question, it appeared that some of it, what you would want to do, might appear to be unpopular to begin with. But if you are able to convey this message, and I'm glad that at least in India these days, there is this, uh, you know, there is a possibility of conveying such messages. People are getting so there, some tough decisions are being taken. These tough decisions relate to not only education in otherwise. So recently we had this farm bill going through, which appeared to be tough to begin with, 
but i think people are gradually coming to understand that it is useful to them that's where the communication skill of the politician matters so we have to provide tools to the politician data to the politician reasons to the politician so that he can convey to the masses at large that though it might appear to be unpopular so i go back to the experience that i had how is it being corrected now at that point in time the judiciary came down and stated but in the national education policy they have understood the cause of the problem the cause of the problem was which would probably not be understood outside the country here in admissions to the good universities in the country the marks that you obtain in class 10 they become very important so what we did was we wanted to correct that right now all the boards spike the marks that is you won't believe it here people get 100 out of 100 in english literature shakespeare must be turning in his grave and i was shocked how do you do that so i tried to stop it i called all the state board i said what's nonsense how can you get 100 out of 100 in english literature or in hindi literature but they got it and the reason was that that enabled them to get admission in universities because anyone who got less than 99 didn't get the admission so there was spiking marks mind you this is a fact there was spiking marks by 10% so if you got 89 you would end up getting 99 that was happening so i tried to stop it here again the high courts put a stay order they understood that mr anil so will retire in next 3 months and then no one is going to push it now why did it continue let's try and understand this because every stakeholders were happy happy the child was happy he got 99% the parents were happy they could you know show that their child had got it the teachers were very happy so many people getting 99 100% the school was happy the states everyone was happy so this farce i call it farcical delusion in my book so it continued so i tried to stop it i convinced them they all agreed state boards i said let's not get into this farcical delusion but you know one or two persons they went to the court because their ward was appearing in the class 12 examination and they got a stay order now what the new what the national education policy does now is that it says that these marks shall not be considered for admission to university they will have a separate entrance test in one stroke they have done away with the reason for spiking of marks the competitive uh, you know bidding for the marks 9900 so what i now how is it being sold is being sold that in the long run the child will discover his actual value by giving him 9900% marks now in english literature he doesn't become a shakespeare does he but you feel that you become one by getting 100 out of 100 so that is being sold now it been accepted so the key would here would be how does an idea which may beneficial be beneficial in the long run and that happens happens with taxation with development you sacrifice some of the present for the future you do that it has so far not happened in the field of education but i am glad it's happening now in india and probably it will happening elsewhere so it's all a question of marketing an idea of selling that idea that you may have to sacrifice or apparent sacrifice at this point in time for a brighter future Thank you. Lots of messages around around the kind of storytelling and the communication coming through. Uh, Swet Lee, would you like to come in? Yeah. So I just want to address the question on long term change versus short term concession. Um, I didn't share the whole story of what happened to my minister. So after a year and a half of being in the office, uh, he actually had to resign due to political pressure because a lot of the policies that he introduced um, basically didn't seem that popular to the public. um and after which there was effectively a political coup so now we have a new government that took over and what i've seen is you know in the last two years that we introduced the policies all the policies that we introduced were basically effectively scrapped off um and in fact the new minister even gave a directive saying that we have to discontinue policies from the previous minister so as you can see if we rely on political personalities a lot of long term reforms are not going to happen because everyone has their own agenda everyone comes with their own ideas and that's that's quite dangerous actually to the system um and i think in malaysia i'm not sure about the other countries but in malaysia there is an obsession with political personalities thinking that these are saviors to to you know to to create reforms in the system um we often look at people instead of the system and i think that's quite dangerous so i think in terms of long term change i think it's quite important to not focus really on finding champions within the system as well as say earlier with the civil service for example um focus really on finding what who are the champions or who are the leaders or middle leaders or top leaders who are able to carry on policies regardless of who are the political masses of the day and um you know look at district leaders look at teachers and school leaders these are the people who are going to be in the system regardless of who the people or who the government of the day is so that's number one finding champions within the system and really working through the system as opposed to just relying on political um agenda and political will 
And the second thing, which we didn't quite see in Malaysia, but could be done so much better, is how do we organize different pressure groups that are pressuring the government, right? Um, in Malaysia, especially, there are different pressure groups like the unions, like civil society, for example, but they are not completely organized around common agenda. Um, so they are not able to pressure the government of the day from the bottom up. And I think that is something, if you really want to create long-term change, that's, that's, what, that's a big role that the stakeholders from the bottom can play. Um, because essentially that, that pressure is, is what the government of the day will listen to, right? So yeah, those two things. Great. Thank you. Okay, Louis? Yeah, and, and one thing that I, I, I think is interesting, and even though it seems like I'm not talking about the long versus short term, but it, it's something that I, um, I I thought about when I was in, in office and continue to think permanently, which is what I, what I kind of use the term of, of, of the endowment effect. And you know that in behavioral economics, endowment effect is how people in general are, 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 are they tend to assign a higher value to things that they own. And so in educational systems, it's very important to understand what do people think they own when it comes to their educational system. So if you go to um, especially high performing educational systems, you will find very quickly that the public is endowed to their educational system. And because they're endowed to certain features of their educational system, it's very ha hard to take that away. And, and that's why it doesn't matter if the government changes, it's relatively easy to maintain certain levels of political, sorry, of educational quality, because once again, the public is endowed with these things. It may be the Finnish educational system that has certain features, the South Korean educational system that has certain features, and it's the public that owns it. So the big question is, how do you create educational reforms and policies that end up uh, becoming part of that public endowment. If you're able to do that, if you're able, for example, in Latin America, there's endowment around the issue of access. People feel that they cannot take schools away from them because during the 90s and 2000s, the governments were very successful in creating access. And so everyone now expects that if they need a chair, and a slot in their school, they're going to find one. That is not true across the world. There are other countries where the people are okay with their government not providing a seat. Now, if you go to Latin America, people are not endowed with quality. The proxy that they use uh, for educational quality is actually a building because they're endowed with access, but not with quality. So how can you, when you think about the long-term, one of the things that I'm always thinking is how can you implement policies today that will produce an endowment effect in a way that it doesn't matter what happens in one government, two governments, three governments, five governments, it has become a part of, 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 of the public, again, endowment of people and therefore it will be protected. It's challenging, but I believe that it is a very good uh, proxy for implementation and design because otherwise you can be guaranteed that whatever you do today, it's going to change to governments down the line. Thank you. I'm just going to quickly jump to uh, Anna Swarup, sir, just with your, because I gather you are leaving us shortly. So before you go, could you leave us with your three considerations, uh, key considerations for generating uh, political will? My mind, as I said in the beginning, uh, I am not very sure whether I'm fit enough to advise a politician on what he should do. I will only suggest what can possibly be done. Uh, I am talking about the Indian context, and I think uh, politicians have sufficiently evolved here, as gets reflected in the national education policy, for them to understand education is important. For me, the key component is not so much political will, as in terms of uh, getting across instruments and ideas through which such ideas could be implemented. For me, the key problem in the country, uh, in our country, is that of implementation and not so much of ideas. There's no doubt of ideas. As I said. So it's, I, it's more to do with the implementation part we have to work out the nitty gritties and details of the policy intent that has been announced. So I would I would not comment on what I would do to get the political will going. I'm not competent enough to do that, but I would believe that political will already exists. Now the question is, how do we make it happen on the ground? Thank you very much. I enjoyed being here. I left my email ID. Those that want to get in touch with me can get across to me. Thank you very much for inviting me here. God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's just go back uh, briefly. Uh, Jonathan, did you have anything you wanted to say on these questions of uh, the long term versus the short term? Um, 
and the role of different stakeholders? No, I mean, I, I strongly agree with what Louis was saying earlier, which is, you know, you, you have to keep on reiterating your long term vision. Uh, and you have to, I like, I like the, the, the phrase that you use endowment and you, you do sort of make these things part of the, of the, the political baseline. Uh, and once you've got them, it is harder for a subsequent political party to row back on them. Uh, and, and that is how you get change to happen in the long term. Once it's built in such that nobody feels politically that they can reverse it, that's when you have achieved real long term gain. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question, Danielle, before uh, which we can then wrap into the final round of free consideration. So would you, have you got one more question you'd like to share, Danielle? Hey, Log. So we received a couple of questions for uh, Jonathan and for uh, Swarup, but there's a question that could be interesting for all. And it is uh, about let me see here, it is here. Okay, so what about the, sorry, I'm kind of lost. Okay, I got it. So and although I hear the six levels that need to happen to make a politician make a decision, typically the financial one is the one that most comes up as barrier. So what do you think about that barrier of the financial barrier where you are talking about educational uh, policies and the implementation of them? Right, okay, so reflections on, on maneuvering the complexities of economic and financial considerations when they're securing political change. Uh, I saw you unmute yourself, Louis, so I'm gonna take that as a hint that you've got something you want to say. That, did, did you mean me? Yeah. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So I actually don't think, I, most governments spend a, a very significant amount of their budget in education. So we tend to forget that because we know, it, we wish there was more. But in, in most governments around the world, education is one of the top three budget lines. In, in my own country, in Colombia, it's the top budget line. So when you think about that, is it, oh, there is, there are no financial resources, but you're saying, wait, that means that every other sector in the country or most other sectors in the country are actually below the education. So that means that we've gotten to a point where governments on average, governments around the world devote a very significant amount of financial resources. So I don't think it's really about the financial resources, but about how to spend those financial resources. And, and the real complexity here, I'm gonna go back to these, is the fact that educational systems are so heavy on human capital and labor. Because they're so labor intensive, it's very easy to fall into a mechanic where you have a lot of budget, but very little flexibility in how you spend that budget. And so the finances are there, the numbers are there, the, 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 the dollar amount is right there. I think the fight is more about how to make sure that this is not quickly captured into a system that again becomes recurrent, predictable and impossible to, to steer around. And I think that is where the battle is. So when, when I, I remember like a lot of people said, we need to go to Congress to get more money. And I said, we actually need to go to con Congress to get more freedom. Uh, uh, and I meant freedom in the way we spent the money because the money was enough if we were able, of course, of course, every country would like to have more money, but let's be realistic. I mean, we're education sector, sector is, is really up there in most countries. So if you're able to better design the way resources are allocated, if you're able to remove some of, of the barriers, I think you, you, you will uh, end up producing much better effects than simply adding the budget. And the last thing I'm gonna say is, you, we've seen these again and again and again, where governments in fact go to Congress they in fact get more money and nothing happens. And the reason nothing happens is that these money is very quickly captured into the system that I just described, which is a system that captures those rents and, and spends them in a way that is, that, that is actually ineffective when it comes to producing change. So I, I'm, I'm an advocate for how to spend money rather than, than simply adding more, more, more dollars to the table because it usually doesn't produce the effect we would want them to. 
Okay, thank you. And I'm seeing a really interesting uh, comparisons going on in the chat box here of people comparing spending in, in different countries. And I think that's really interesting because in these discussions, it's easy not to actually peg it to these, these factual considerations of how thing, things are varying. So it's it's really useful to see that and feel free to, to carry on adding a few comparisons in there. We've got figures for Bangladesh, the US, Egypt, UK, um, it's really interesting to see. Um, Swetlin, Jonathan, any thoughts on this, on the financial considerations, financial economic? Yeah, I mean, look, once again, I, <laughs> I agree with Louis. Um, there's there's some really interesting data in the UK, which is, is, is a little bit old now, but I see no reason why it's changed, which is that but for long and complicated reasons, different uh, are equivalent to different districts in the UK. Schools are funded at different levels. Uh, so you can have two otherwise identical schools a few kilometers from each other, and they will receive potentially quite significantly different amounts of, of, of dollars per pupil. And what that allows you to do is to look at what impact that has. And the study shows that more or less, I'm simplifying slightly, but more or less, the amount of dollars you get per pupil has almost no correlation to the standards that your pupils perform at in terms of standardized test results. Uh, and it has relatively limited difference in terms of the teaching staff you can attract, which is where the majority of your, your dollars go. Uh, and, and that is precisely because it is about how you use that money. And there are wildly different things you can do with money in the school system. Uh, and the, the, the English system does have more flexibility. As a head teacher or a principal of a school, you have almost total budgetary autonomy. Uh, and you, you pay for your teachers yourselves. That's not paid for centrally. Uh, you pay for the teachers yourselves, but you have almost total hiring and firing autonomy. You have a reasonable amount of salary autonomy. And everything else that's not teachers, you have total autonomy over. So you can decide how many textbooks you buy. Uh, how much your, your electricity and gas bills are, whether you want lots of money spent on sports and music or not very much money. It, it is one of the most autonomous systems in the whole world. And, and that, what that does show is that there are differences, differences in the effective use of spend by head teachers and principals and districts. And uh, therefore, I strongly agree that it's not just about additional money. It's about what you do with that money and spending it on the things which are shown consistently to be more effective in increasing pupil outcomes. Okay, thank you. And Swetley, and then if everyone could, uh, three speakers could have ready the, the three points to close us off. I'm seeing loads of more interesting questions coming up. But I'm afraid we are coming to the end of the Q&A, but I'm sure the discussion will continue, whether that be on, on Twitter or in, in other discussion forums as, as we go on. Uh, but Swetley, finance and economics. No, no, nothing much to add to what Louis and Jonathan have already said. Okay, cool. In which case, uh, we will take a, a round of thoughts on those uh, three key considerations. And we'll go in the, the same order that we went at the start, uh, which means we'll start off with Louise. Um, so yeah, what are your three, three considerations that we should all bear in mind uh, when generating political will for education equity? Uh, but you're muted. It had to happen once on this call. This would not have been a Zoom yes, call if course. I didn't get to say that at least once. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Luke. So three quick things. Um, the first one I already mentioned is, is this notion that, that it's true, but it's not all the truth. And, and I think understanding that is, is very important. Otherwise, if you come especially from a technical background, it may become the case that you grow constantly frustrated because how come people don't understand it? If, if it's there, if the data is there, why why are people not understanding it? And it's actually it's actually you who's not understanding the fact that there's other realities out there. Um, and I didn't understand it many times. So I think that's the first one. The second thing, I, uh, we didn't touch much on these, but is even though when you talk about politics, people tend to think, oh, okay, the reality of politics, real politics, I actually have one kind of one principle here is don't, don't lose idealism. Because I thoroughly believe that in order to garner political will, you need to be an idealist that is able to balance that with pragmatism, but be an idealist. And I think most of the changes that we've seen in education are the result of, of idealism that is able to, to land into a, a real political space, but be an idealist. Otherwise, you're going to conform what is out there and there's gonna be no changes. And the last one, uh, the way I call it is, posters don't last forever. So 
if you want to garner political will, if you, if you want to be able to make changes, make sure you just don't do it through posters. And, and a lot of educational policy is done through a lot of posters. But posters don't really last forever. Posters are, 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 are very short-lived. So make sure that you, that you draw into deep, well-thought, well-designed um, policies that even though they're complex, they will garner that endowment that I was talking about earlier, rather than just going out there with, with, with a bunch of nice posters that are going to make you feel happy. It's gonna be an adrenaline shot because everyone's gonna be talking about that. And then uh, a couple of months later, everybody will have, will have forgotten. Great, fantastic, thank you. Uh, Swetli? So this is just gonna be a reiteration of what I've already said earlier. So instead of thinking of building political will from top down, you know, as a fellow in the classroom, I've always asked myself that question, right? Who are the leaders who can actually bring about great policies um, for reform? So instead of thinking it top down, I think my experience um, in the political office is really how do we garner that kind of influence from bottom up instead to pressure the leadership um, you know, there are three groups of people that I can think of from the top of my mind to really build sustained commitment. Um, and the first one is the champions within the system. So who are the administrators, who are the leaders within the system that we can cultivate um, so that whoever the leadership is, there, there is that sustained commitment to pursue the goals that we have achieved, that we wanted to achieve in the beginning. So the second group would be the pressure groups I mentioned earlier, how do we build consensus? Um, and Teach for Malaysia in Malaysia is a great example of a pressure group that we can harness its energy from because there's so many fellows and alumni who have been in the classroom. So how can we get pressure, uh, how, how do we get different groups of um, organizations to build collectively, build collectively for a common agenda who can then pressure the government of the day. And finally, the last thing is how do we um, lobby politicians across different divide to, to, to give their commitment towards education. Um, and that's something that is going to be the hardest actually, um, because they all have their interest, but I've seen it being fairly successful in Malaysia in terms of there was a recent initiative to lower um, the voting age and they were very successful in lobbying politicians from across the divide to actually put their commitment towards it. So I think that will be the third thing that will be quite important as well. Great, thank you. And it's interesting your point about who are the leaders in there and, and uh, ties in, I think I saw Emilio in the chat saying about cautioning against the idea of seeing policy as a silver bullet and remembering that there, there is leadership at, at all those levels and the importance of affecting change throughout the system. So that's great. Thank you. Jonathan, round us off. So I think the three things I would say are um, think about everyone is the first point. Think about all the stakeholders. Don't just think about parents don't just think about teachers groups think about everyone because uh, there are a huge amount of stakeholders in education change uh, and you need a majority of them to come with you if you're really trying to build a program so think about all of your stakeholders first and think about whether you can either co-opt them uh, or push past them secondly remember that politicians are people they are often elected as politicians they are going to be political but they are also humans they have human emotion, they have human biases, they have human preferences, uh, they are not technocrats, and therefore they are going to be influenced in different ways. And when you're speaking to politicians directly, think about the different ways in which they are likely to respond. Some will respond to data, some will respond to story, some will respond to money, some will respond to threats, some will respond to um, cajoling uh, and, and think about politicians as humans. And thirdly, if you can't, do it all in one big step. Think about what a succession of small steps are. Think about what a plan is. Don't. I, I agree with uh, the previous discussion about not not downplaying the radicalism of your final agenda, but don't just think you have to get there in one step. Set out a number of small steps to get there. Lock those in. And and politics is 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 the art of the possible. It is about doing what you can do, and often that is less than you would like it to be. But as long as you are moving in the direction you want to. Uh, don't don't beat yourself up. Don't feel that that's not making education reform happen. These things happen in a series of small incremental steps, and that is still better than not doing any of those steps. Great. So it's a hugely hugely helpful list from everyone there to to finish us off, and hopefully we've come and completed this uh, narrative arc from the from the failure and the negative to the to the art of the possible, as you put it, Jonathan. So. Thank you so much for that. Um, we are coming to the close. Um, you're welcome, and it would be great to hear your reflections if you, if um, the audience would be happy to share those either in the chat box there or on the on the Bizabo Biz something app that I'm supposed to mention to you. Uh, so yeah, feel free to share, share thoughts there. 
Um, and there is also a, um, a group discussion uh, following this uh, about working in education policy uh, for conference attendees, uh, if you'd like to join that later. Uh, Zyra's just posted a link to that in the community interest, uh, in the chat box for the community interest room. Um, but I'd really like to say a huge thank you to our speakers today. It's been a, an amazing mix, um, balancing the kind of very personal stories of, of what their, their experiences at the heart of government have been. Uh, but also some really practical advice for all of us here who are, who are so keen to make a difference to educational equity in this field. So thank you so much um, and do keep in touch. I've put my Twitter handle in the chat box and I'd love to hear from you all in the future. So thank you.